Yes, got it. Okay, so hello everybody. Um, first of all, thank you for for the kind invitation to uh, to to this group to give a talk about metaphor and meta analysis. So this is what I would like to cover today, talk a little bit about the development of metaphor, then we'll do a small tutorial on some of its basic functionality, and then we'll take a short break. And then I want to highlight some interesting applications. So some of the sort of more advanced modeling cap capabilities of the metaphor package. And in the chat, you already saw a link to uh, the script. So if you want to follow along with the, with the demo later on, then you can get the script under this link. And maybe somebody can post that link in the chat again. All right, so um, let me first talk a little bit about software for meta-analysis more generally, sort of from a historical perspective. So when, when meta-analysis came about, well, initially there wasn't really any software for it. So people had to write custom, custom programs for it. But eventually, like in the 90s, we started to get some software packages specifically dedicated to meta-analysis, DSTAT, True Epistat, FastPro, these were all DOS programs, if you remember those. Um, or some people wrote macros for SAS or SPSS to, to do some basic meta-analytic kind of computations. And then in 93, we have the first version of the Review Manager being released. So that's the software that is used by the Cochrane Collaboration for, for running their analyses or writing up the, these, these Cochrane reports or reviews. Then in 97, 98, we get two software packages with a nice graphical user interface, MetaWin, which uh, well, was quite popular uh, among biologists or ecologists because it was written also by a group from that discipline. Uh, that's no longer around anymore, but CMA, Comprehensive Meta-Analysis, is still around. So, and then finally in 99, we have the first R package, the R meta package. Um, at the time uh, in 99, we were on version 0.65 of R. So that was a long time ago. Um, but the package, the R meta package had some basic capabilities, but it couldn't do meta regression. So it couldn't, couldn't do analyses where you look for relationships between some predictors and some effect sizes. I needed to do or fit these types of models for my dissertation research, which I was doing around the time. And so I wrote a function that could do this. And uh, eventually I put this on my website and people to my surprise started to use this. This was also around the time when the meta package was released. And then after in the uh, following years, we have a few other packages. Then in 2009, that's when I published the metaphor package. So I kept sort of expanding on that one function and, and I wrote some additional functions for forest plots, funnel plots. <clears throat> and so this turned into the first version of metaphor. Now we have over 150 packages on CRAN. There are even more packages, of course, on GitHub and other places. So if you want to sort of get an overview of the CRAN packages, you can go to the task view on meta-analysis and get a nice overview. And in this figure, you can sort of see the date of the first version released on CRAN of packages over time and the cumulative number of packages. So we have R meta, then the meta package metaphor, and we have some more specialized packages being released. For example, the net meta package for network meta analysis. We'll get to hear about MetaSAM, Club Sandwich, and MetaGam next week. Meta Meta is not on CRAN, but on, on GitHub, so I didn't include it here. We also have packages that are not so much about analyzing data, but um, help with the whole research synthesis workflow, like MetaGear, RevTools for screening articles, things like this. And just a week ago or so, we released a uh, package called Metadat, which is just a package um, of meta-analysis data sets. So yet another package. I fitted an exponential growth model to this because while well, I have to fit models whenever I see 
uh, something going up like this. So it, it is exponential growth, although things seem to be slowing down here. So maybe we have finally broken the point where things are not just um, increasing exponentially anymore. All right, so back to metaphor. So in 2009, I released the first version. And since then, 30 versions have been released on CRAN so far. The latest one mm -hmm. just, just uh, relatively Gosh. recently. And if you want to take a look at the change log, there's a, a whole change log of how things have developed over time. But what I want to do is I want to sort of highlight some milestones. So when I initially released the package, it had a function, the rma.uni function for fitting these sort of standard fixed random mixed effects models that are commonly used in meta-analysis. And then there were also two functions which are sort of more specialized for dichotomous or count outcomes for the mental Hansel method and Peters method. So if you have two by two tables like treatment control, number of people in each group who were cured or where the treatment worked versus where it didn't work. Well, so you have these two by two tables, then we have some specialized methods for, for meta-analyzing this type of data. Then I kept expanding on the capabilities of the package by adding some additional functions related to publication bias, the rec test, rank test functions. So sort of, well, not directly testing for publication bias, but for symptoms of it. I will come back to this in a little bit. We have some functions then for cumulative meta-analyses or for some sensitivity analyses, these leave one out analyses where we just leave out one study at a time and we can examine how much this impacts the results. Uh, permutation tests can be done. And then in 2010, I was working on a paper about the metaphor package, which eventually made its way into the Journal of Statistical Software. And this is when I sort of bumped up the package to version one. I needed to make some further improvements to the package. That's also when I started the metaphor website. And then things slowed down a little bit. I kept, of course, working on the package, but it took another two years for the next version to be released. And this is when I added this GLMM function, which also includes some sort of specialized methods for dichotomous and counter outcomes. So we can also use generalized linear mixed effects models for analyzing these types of data. And this was sort of implemented in this function. Then a really big milestone especially for me, was the rma.mv function, which I will talk about in more detail later on. This can do multi-level, multivariate type of modeling. And I think this is one actually of the unique features of the metaphor package. So I will demonstrate some of these advanced capabilities uh, later on. And um, so uh, quite a bit of work has gone into also improving this function adding the capability to use sparse matrices. If we have the time at the end, I would say a few words about this or some additional modeling capabilities for autoregressive structures. If you are repeatedly measuring some effect in a group, um, then you have typically estimates that are autocorrelated and we may want to account uh, for the dependencies through these autoregressive structures. Um, the package also has some parallel processing capabilities when you're doing some of the really like computationally intensive stuff, then you can save some time by using parallel processing if you have a, a suitable powerful computer for this. The package also includes a function for robust variance estimation or cluster robust standard errors. Um, I'm not going to be talking about this today because uh, James will demonstrate the club sandwich package, which does the same thing, but even better than what the robust function does. I was a bit slow, like adapting some of these hipster programming practices, software development practices, but eventually I started to use Git and GitHub. So I moved with the crowd. So I made the development of Metaphor a little bit more transparent by making it a sort of a bit more public how, how things are developing. Um, yeah, let me skip this. Then the reporter function, I will demonstrate this in a little bit, what it does. Uh, it's kind of a neat feature. Um, some more parallel processing capabilities, spatial correlation structures. I will give a, 
um, illustration of this later on. Then I added some functions that make uh, make it possible or more easily possible to, to do network meta-analyses with metaphor. So what is a network meta-analysis? So if you have sort of studies that have examined all kinds of different treatments for a medical condition, then um, you may want to synthesize all of these studies to see what are the more effective treatments, the less effective treatments. This is sometimes called a network meta-analysis. And so there's some functions in metaphor that make it a bit more easy um, to, to run these type of analyses. And then in the last update, I added selection models and some other functionality for dealing with publication bias and so-called location scale models. All right, so over time, the, the package has grown. I started at less than 5,000 lines of code, and now I'm over 30,000 lines of code, and well, it seems to be more like a linear trend, not so exponential. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about some of the features of the package and how this sort of all fits together. So when you're doing a meta-analysis, the first thing that you need to do is you need to quantify the phenomenon that you are interested in from the studies in terms of some kind of effect size or outcome measure. So if you have studies with a treatment control group and a dichotomous outcome, like patients who have recovered versus not recovered, you get these two by two tables, and then you can compute things like risk differences, risk ratios, odds ratios. If you have treatment control groups and you have quantitative measurements within studies, then authors of the studies will typically report means and standard deviations. And then you can compute mean differences or standardized mean differences to indicate how much of a difference was there between the treated versus the control group. When you're looking at the association between two variables, then Authors, study authors may report correlation coefficients, which you may then want to meta-analyze. So often we transform these using Fisher's R to Z transformation. We can also do meta-analyses on proportions of individual groups or transformations thereof, or measures of change within groups, or we can meta-analyze measure, measures of reliability. So if you have, for example, Cronbach's alpha, uh, for a particular scale from multiple studies, then now sometimes what people are doing is they're meta-analyzing these, these alpha values or transformations thereof to sort of get a better sense of how reliable a particular scale is. We can also quantify not just the central tendency within, let's say, treatment versus a control group, so what is the mean in the two groups, but also we can look at the variance of the measurements within the treatment group and the control group, and then compute some kind of difference of that. So we have effect sizes or outcome measures that quantify variability and group differences of, of that. Um, so we can meta-analyze a lot of things and the metaphor package has a function, the ESCalc function, which we'll look at in a little bit in more detail, and it can compute over 60 uh, different types of effect size or outcome measures. Some of those are quite esoteric and nobody ever will use them, but quite a number of them are actually uh, useful. So once you have these effect sizes or these outcomes from a bunch of different studies, then you want to synthesize these, these values. You want to pool them or average them in some way. And so we have these fixed or random effects models, or we can do meta regression where we look um, at the relationship between the observed effects and sort of characteristics of the studies. Um, the studies are not all the same. They differ from each other. We can sort of capture these differences in some variables and then look for relationships and, and fit meta-regression models. I mentioned this already, mental Hensel and Peters method. These are, again, specialized methods for analyzing two by two tables or, or dichotomous outcomes. We also have these generalized linear mixed effects models or logistic mixed effects or Poisson models for analyzing dichotomous outcomes or counter outcomes. Then we have these 
more complex structures that typically arise in meta-analyses, multiple effects coming from the same study or be, multiple effects being measured in the same group of participants. Well, then you need maybe multi-level or multivariate type of models to deal with that. And also network meta-analyses, when you have many treatments for maybe the same condition, do you want to synthesize all of these different studies and then some more specialized methods. Of course, visualization is a big thing and quite important. We have the well-known forest and funnel plots and then things like bubble plots. We'll show, look at, or I'll show some of these and we'll look at some of these in more detail. And some plots that you may have not come across, Baujat plots, Labé, radial plots, Gosh plots. Oh my gosh, what is a Gosh plot? We'll look at those. Then we have uh, methods related to publication bias. So that's of course a big thorny issue for meta-analyses or just more generally for research synthesis, not just meta-analysis. Any form of research synthesis needs to think about publication bias. And so we cannot really directly test for publication bias, but we can maybe detect some symptoms of it. And we have some tests to pick up some of these symptoms. And we may even look at the sensitivity of the results to certain forms of publication bias. So the trim and fill method, I know it has been critiqued quite a bit, but um, it's sort of a method to, to look at how sensitive the results are to a certain form of publication bias or suppression. And we have some methods to even maybe try to correct for publication bias, these selection models. We'll take a brief look at those in a little bit. So there are some techniques here to sort of address or maybe deal with publication bias. Although in the end, um, I just want to mention this, the, 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 the real way to deal with publication bias is just to get rid of it. Fancy st statistical methods are not the solution to publication bias, but okay, that's a, it's a whole another topic. And uh, well, I could go on a long rant about this, but let's move on. Um, in terms of inference methods. So of course you're fitting these models. You want to construct confidence intervals. You want to test things. We can do this with sort of standard techniques like wall type tests or likelihood ratio tests. Although these tests or like wall tests are essentially Z tests, which may work asymptotically if you have hundreds of studies, but in smaller meta-analyses, these may not work so well. We have some specialized methods, the Knapp and Hartung method, which sort of is a refinement, gives you approximate T tests, which, uh, which work better. Prediction intervals, quite important. That those tell you something about heterogeneity. So how much effects vary across studies. And we'll look at those in a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, permutation tests, cluster robust tests, this is all possible. Cumulative meta-analyses, you will look at that in a little bit. You can also combine the metaphor package with other packages, for example, for bootstrapping or multi-model inference for multiple imputation. So these packages work nicely together with each other and you can find under these links here, uh, demonstrations of this. I will eventually post these slides also on my website and you can follow this up if you're interested. We can also look at outliers. So are there maybe some studies that are really different from the rest? Well, we can do this visually or look at residuals or standardized studentized residuals. We can look at the influence of studies on the results. So we have things like Cook's distances, which you may know from re regular regression modeling, where we can take these ideas and extend them to meta-analytic models. And you can also look at these things at a higher level, like if you have a more complex structure with multiple effects from the same study, you may not be so interested in how much influence a particular effect has on, on the results, but maybe a whole study. So we can also look at cluster level outlier or influence statistics. So one of the big problems I think is when, when you are starting to work with a with a new package is that often it's quite overwhelming to to sort of figure out how a package works and how it all fits together just 
just to demonstrate this here, let's say I take the NLME package, which is a great, great package, right? This is a package for, for doing uh, mixed effects, uh, linear mixed effects models and nonlinear mixed effects models, really great package. But you, you call up the documentation of the package and this list of functions and you scroll through this and the feeling that I have when I see something like this is where, where do I even get started, right? That's one of the big problems, I think, when you need to start working with a package, you may eventually figure out that this is one of the main modeling functions. But again, how does this all fit together? And so this slide here shows a flow diagram that kind of illustrates how in the metaphor package, things kind of fit together, right? So you need to first read in some data um, from, from a spreadsheet or from some database. And then if you haven't already computed these effect sizes or outcomes, then you can use the ESCalc function that will allow you to compute things like log risk ratios or standardized mean differences and things like this. That then serves as input to these modeling functions, which then give you an object and that object can be passed on to other functions for uh, outlier diagnostics, uh, influence diagnostics, for um, examining the results, for publication bias, for certain visualizations and so on, right? So I think this is kind of helpful and provides kind of a nice overview of how things fit together. Okay, so at this point, I want to um, go through that script that uh, hopefully that was posted again in the chat. So I want to sort of do a little bit of a demo of some of the things that you can do with Metaphor. So I'm gonna switch, no, I didn't want to switch one second. That's not what I wanted to open. I want it to go. It's always great when you do live demos and uh, things work super smoothly. Okay, here we go. All right. Uh, so uh, the first thing that you need to do is uh, install the metaphor package if you haven't done that yet. And then we can load the metaphor package. And so in the metaphor package, we have a bunch of data sets for illustration purposes. And one of them is the BCG data set. So what's the BCG data set? So BCG is a vaccine. Ooh, vaccines. We hear a lot about vaccines uh, in, in recent times. Well, this is a vaccine against tuberculosis. And it was developed by Guerin and Calmet around the Second World War. And it was then tested in 13 trials. So the first trial, I think, was by Aronson in 1948. These are not chronologically ordered here. Um, and what we have here in this data set is we have, we have treated groups, vaccinated, uh, the vaccinated group and the control group. And then we have the number of TB positive and negative cases in the treated group and the number of positive and negative cases in the control group, right? So this essentially gives you the data for such a two by two table. And based on such a two by two table, we can compute things like risk ratios, odds ratios, or for a meta-analysis, what we need is log risk ratios. So we log transform these values. And so when you have a data set like this, we can then use the ESCalc function for computing these different types of measures, for example, RR, that will give you then these log risk ratios. We need two, uh, sorry, four variables as input, right? So for, these, uh, for this two by two table of each study. So we have arguments A, I, B, I, C, I, D, I, and we pass these four variables to the function. And then we can also add study labels for um, when we then draw a forest plot, then we get some study labels. This is not crucial here, but we'll make some of the plots later on look a bit nicer. So this is the ESCalc function. And so when I run this, let me make this a bit smaller. 
Then we get two new variables here in the data set uh, called yi. These are the log risk ratios and vi. These are the corresponding variances. So these, these estimates of the effectiveness of the vaccine, uh, they, they are not all equally precise. You have bigger studies with over 160,000 participants, and you have smaller studies with maybe 100, 200 participants. So you wouldn't expect that these estimates are all equally precise, and that is reflected in these different, different uh, variances. And so we want to pay attention more to the more precise estimates. So when we combine these log risk ratios, we usually use some kind of weighting in meta-analysis. So there's some kind of weighting happening based on the precision of the estimates. Um, just in terms of the interpretation of these values, um, if they are zero, a log risk ratio of zero would indicate that the risk is the same in both groups. If it is negative here, then this indicates that the risk is lower in the treated or the vaccinated group compared to the control group. So a lower risk of um, a TB infection in vaccinated groups, mostly except for this one study here. All right, so now we want to combine these 13 estimates. And then we have the one of the main modeling functions, RMA, which is really the RMA.uni function, but you can just write RMA, that's the same thing. So that's one of the main functions here. And as input, you just give these, these estimates and the corresponding variances. And well, where can these, these variables be found? Inside dot. I call all my data sets dot because I'm a lazy typer. That's short and quick to type. And so then we get the results from a random effects model. So that's a particular type of model for pooling these results together. We get an estimate of the amount of heterogeneity. So what the random effects model briefly, what it um, accounts for is that the underlying true effects or the true log risk ratios may not all be the same across these 13 studies, right? The effectiveness of the vaccine may be larger or smaller in certain studies. Now, the underlying true log risk ratios may differ, that the observed estimates differ, that's a given, but the underlying true effects may or may not be homogeneous or heterogeneous, and we can get an estimate based on this random effects model of how much variance there is in these underlying true effects. This is tau squared or often denoted tau squared. Then we have a test for heterogeneity. So the, the assumption, the null hypothesis is that uh, for this test is that the true effects are homogeneous but the test is highly significant. So we reject this and we would conclude that the effectiveness, the true effectiveness of the vaccine appears to differ across studies. Then we get an estimate of the average effectiveness of the average log risk ratio. So this is the pooled estimate based on these 13 studies. If you put in log risk ratios, and out comes a, a pooled log risk ratio, right? So whatever you put in, you get out. You get a test of whether this is significantly different from, from zero or maybe even better, let's construct a confidence interval for our pooled estimate. But again, these are log risk ratios, which are a bit hard to interpret. So for an easier interpretation, what we can do is we can back transform. If you take a log risk ratio and you exponentiate it, then you get a risk ratio. So this is what we can do with the predict function. We give it the model object. We specify how to transform the results. We want to exponentiate and then maybe just round the results to two digits. So what we find is a pooled risk ratio of 0 0.5. So on average, vaccinated groups have about half of the risk of a TB infection than non-vaccinated groups. 
And so this is the result for my meta-analysis with a confidence interval and a prediction interval. So the prediction interval, what that tells me is how much can the risk ratio vary across studies? We have an average risk ratio, a pooled risk ratio, but that doesn't tell us anything about how much the risk ratio may vary across individual studies. And this is what the prediction interval tells me. So this tells me that there could very well be studies where the risk is 85% lower in treated groups. So one minus 0.15, 85% lower in treated groups. There could also be studies where the risk is actually 55% higher in treated groups. So the effect is all over the place. Yes, on average, it seems like the vaccine is effective. But in any individual study, the, the effectiveness could be all the way over here versus there. So we don't really know where it may be. All right, then we have the forest function. So the forest function, what does it do? It draw, draws forest plots. So you just give the model object to the forest function, and then you get this, this basic forest plot. We have the study labels here. Right, this is uh, from having used SLAP earlier on, so that sort of gets passed down into this, and then the forest function can find these study labels. But well, I'm not quite happy with this yet. So we may want to make uh, add some headers here, and we can also use add pred. What this will do is it will show the prediction interval. So then we can also see here, not just the, the, av the pool to average and the confidence interval, that's what this little diamond shape here, some people call it a diamond or polygon, that's what this reflects. And then we have here the prediction interval and we have the results from the individual studies. Now, the forest function needs to sort of get all this information into, into a single figure, it's adding these study labels here. There are some defaults for constructing these, these uh, figures, but it doesn't always work perfectly. For example, here you have a bunch of white space, right? That is being sort of wasted. So the, the way it's setting these axis limits and the limits of the whole figure are maybe not ideal. Now, if you use print, on a forest plot, you can see what some of these defaults are. And one of them is called xlim for the x-axis limits, which you, I'm sure you have seen if you have done any kind of plotting with R, with base R graphs, then um, you have xlim for setting the x-axis limits. Well, so over here we have minus eight and over here we have 7.26. So these are sort of determined by the forest function, but this is creating this, this wasted space here. So maybe what we need to do is we need to shrink the, the upper limit a little bit, maybe to six. This is a bit trial and error, but now we are not wasting so much space here, right? So it's, this is a little bit more at the center. So that looks a bit nicer. So this is what XLIM here is doing. I'm sort of trying to make better use of the space in my plotting device or my plotting device. Then the results are again given as log risk ratios. We want to maybe back transform the results. There are different ways of how you can back transform the, uh, the values in a forest plot. You could take each of these values and directly back transform them. But this would give you sort of non-symmetric um, confidence intervals because exponentiation is a non-linear transformation. Instead, what we can do is we can do an access transformation. This is what a trans F allows you to do. And so what this is doing is it's not really changing the figure itself or the values. It is just transforming the axis. And so if you exponentiate the values on the x-axis here, then essentially what you are showing is uh, the risk ratios on a log scale. And so now the default tick marks that are being shown here are maybe a bit weird numbers. Uh, 
So we can also specify on the log scale where we want to place the tick marks. We can do this through the at argument. And then we have here our tick marks at these particular locations. And so again, now you can really see this is a log scale, right? So the distances here are really like multiples of each other, right? So um, this is a three unit distance and this is like a 0 0.75 unit distance, but really these are reflecting the same risk ratio. So they're the axis is on a log scale. And this is sort of a commonly done thing when you're back transforming results in forest plots. So we just back transform the axis. And so this is some functionality also in the forest function. So this is now a forest plot that I wouldn't be entirely embarrassed to put into my paper, I would say. But by default, um, yeah, the defaults are not always ideal and you may have to do a little bit of digging to figure out how to make the forest plot look a bit nicer. We had then we a, have few, yes. Sorry to interrupt. We had a few questions regarding the confidence yes. intervals and just to clarify, uh, the ci.lb is the confidence interval lower bound and uh, upper bound respectively, Correct. but uh, the estimation methods of these, is this uh, something specific or special or is it straightforward using the measurement error? So this is just based on you, let me get ready of the figure. Um, if you just take, so this is a, this is the standard error of the estimate and then a walled type confidence interval can be constructed. Just take the estimate plus and minus 1.96 or twice the standard error, then you get the confidence interval. If you exponentiate these here, that will give you the lower and upper bounds of the confidence interval. So that's really all that is happening here. The prediction interval, that also needs to figure or take into consideration tau square. So how that's computed is a bit more complex, but um, that's essentially what is happening here. Thanks. All right, uh, so uh, funnel plots. So we have funnel plots as another commonly used visualization. So we have the effect size or the outcome on the x-axis, the square root of the variances. So the standard errors on the y-axis. And so it's commonly done that we have uh, the lowest value up top. It's sort of a convention. And then we get this upside down funnel, or we would expect this because, well, for studies that have a large variance or large standard error, we would expect the estimates to fluctuate a lot. And for studies that have a small standard error, it should fluctuate little, but this assumes that there is not like all this heterogeneity going on. So we don't really see the points kind of falling inside of this funnel here so nicely but this is sort of what you would expect. So that's, uh, that's a funnel plot. Now, again, you can do some customization here. These uh, tick marks are maybe not at the ideal location. So let me specify the Y axis limits. And maybe instead of these numbers sideways, which makes your head crooked, we can also make these numbers um, go horizontal. And then, uh, well, so these, these values here on the X and Y axis, these tick mark labels, they are rounded. And while trailing zeros when you're rounding numbers in R are sort of getting dropped. Uh, so we have a zero and then 0 0.2. I'm, I'm a bit OCD about my, my figures and I don't like this. And so um, if, if you don't want this, this uh, point zero getting dropped here, well, there's some, there, this is possible. So there's a digits argument where you can specify to how many digits do you want results to be rounded? Well, so one digit, two digits, but again, how do you then sort of specify, do not drop trailing zeros? Well, um, this you can specify by giving the digits arguments either an integer, so an R, the totally logical way of specifying that something is an integer is with a capital L, right? So this, this defines 
this, this number two here to be an integer as opposed to, oops, uh, no. As opposed to if I just have the number two, that's, that's by default a double. Uh, all right, so if you specify integers, then trailing zeros get dropped. If you don't specify an integer, then they do not get dropped. But now you have a problem in R that if you, for example, combine an integer and a double, well, what happens is that through the, the magical rules of R, this vector gets converted into a double vector. So this integer gets promoted to a double. And so that doesn't work, but well, you can specify a list here. And in a list, you can say, well, this is an integer, this is a double. And so then for my X axis, the trailing zeros are getting dropped, but not for my Y axis. So now all this trouble just to add this point zero here, but I guess I mentioned I'm, I'm half of the stuff in metaphor is just because I, I have like really peculiar preferences of how I want my graphs to look. And so now we can also not drop the trailing zero here. Anyway, probably more than you wanted to know. Let's move on to- We do uh, have another question from yes. the chat. Yes. Uh, the tau squared measured, uh, or is tau squared measured in um, uh, SDI, I assume it's standard deviation units and it's thus- a, Yeah, it's a variance. So that's a variance. And so we just take the square root and then we get a standard deviation. Perfect, thanks. All right, so let's uh, go on to another data set. This is another vaccine, but against cholera. And so we have these studies, we have the number of cholera cases and the total number of participants in the treated group and the number of cholera cases in the control condition. And so you can also um, specify the data in this way. So if you don't have cases, non-cases, but cases and total group size, that's also possible. Here I'm computing log odds ratios. So we have these log odds ratios here. Again, negative numbers indicate that the, not the risk, but the odds is lower in the treated group compared to the non-treated group. And so then we can combine these log odds ratios. And again, we can back transform through exponentiation. So we find that the, we find an pooled odds ratio of 0.45 or about 55% lower odds of um, cholera in, in vaccinated groups compared to non-vaccinated groups. And again, prediction interval, which is not quite as wide here. So uh, all of these values are below one. So even though, um, well, so here the, the vaccine is effective on average, and this is a 95% prediction interval. So in basically 19 out of 20 studies, you would expect then the, the, um, the odds ratio, the true odds ratio to fall within these bounds in individual studies. And so this is below one. So the vaccine seems to be consistently effective, but this is actually not sort of what I wanted to focus on here. Um, I just wanted to show another type of uh, funnel plot. This is sometimes called a contour enhanced funnel plot. It's a funnel plot, but with some modification. We center the funnel plot here, not at the estimate, but at zero. So at the point of no effect, we can put different things on the y-axis. So the default is to put the standard arrow on the y-axis, but we can also put one over the standard arrow. So the sort of the precision of the estimates on the y-axis, then the funnel becomes a bit curved like this. And hang on, let me draw this again. Um, so, and then what we can also add is these regions here to reflect the significance of the studies. Um, so we have these shaded regions. So the white region here, then these are studies where the p-value is be between 0.1 and 1. So not significant. Then we have this dark gray region here that's, those are studies where the p-value is between 0.05 and 0.1, what some people may call marginally significant. 
wait this this is being recorded right oh no can, yeah. we, can we beep this out that part that i said this anyway we will so, try to bleep that okay all right so never say marginally significant right but anyway uh, then we have the sort of this gray region here p value 0 0.01 0 0.05 and then this region outside is like yeah significant with p values below 0.01 so the idea is what you sometimes see is that the points are sort of hugging this border line, border of significance here right um, which makes you wonder what is going on in these studies that they're sort of all kind of just achieving significance or well, sometimes even more significant, sometimes less, but it's a bit peculiar. And so the Cantor enhanced funnel plot is meant to sort of detect this form, this pattern a little bit more easily than the standard funnel plot. So there are all kinds of ideas out there of how you can sort of draw funnel plots and you can draw these as well with a funnel function. Although, as you can see here, I made some customizations in order to achieve this type of plot. Let's... There's a couple of questions yes. from the chat. Uh, the first one relates to the graphic. Is it possible to color code the dots in the contouring yes. plot? Yes, you can. So um, if you look at the help file for the funnel function, it has a col argument. And so you can make the points in different colors. You can awesome. specify a whole vector of colors for every point, so yeah. And then uh, I didn't manage to ask the previous question correctly. Uh, regarding the tau squared, uh, the question was, is the tau squared um, doesn't depend on scale or effect size, is that correct? Uh, it does depend. So if I, um, if I now, what is this here? These are these are log odds ratios that are being meta-analyzed. So this is the variance, the estimated variance of the of the underlying true log odds ratios. So depending on the scale, what you put in, if I would meta-analyze log risk ratios, I would get a different tau square. So this is this depends on on the effect size measure that is being used. So it's scale dependent. Thanks. All right, uh, let's move on here to another meta-analysis. I'm jumping to a bunch of different data sets because some of them are a bit nicer for illustrating this type of graph versus that type of graph. So the meta-analysis by Hackshaw is on the risk of lung cancer in women exposed to environmental tobacco smoke through their smoking spouse. So you have studies, with women where the spouse is either a smoker or a non-smoker. And then you can look at the lung cancer risk in these women who are all non-smokers, but they differ from each other, whether they have a smoking or non-smoking spouse. And so you can look at the lung cancer risk in these two different groups. And that tells you something about how this exposure through, um, through the smoking spouse may impact the risk of lung cancer, right? So uh, this has been researched quite a bit and Hackshaw did a meta-analysis of 37 studies. And so we do find an elevated risk of uh, lung cancer in the exposed women. So these, this data set already directly includes uh, log odds ratio so we don't have to use ES calc here. So this is a pooled log odds ratio, which we can again back transform. So here we find that, um, that on average, exposed women have about a 24% higher odds of lung cancer compared to the non-exposed women. And while that is significant, but again, with a wide prediction interval. Now, let me show you the funnel plot here. So um, here we have the sort of standard funnel plot. What I want to show here is that that what you sometimes see also in funnel plots is sort of, well, let me put the cursor here so you don't see that point because it kind of screws up what I'm trying to say. All right, so let me hide that point. But what, you, what you're lacking here on the left-hand side at the bottom left-hand side is a bunch of points, right? You would expect the points to fluctuate around the pooled effect. And so you would also expect points to be here. But except for that one here, it seems to be like there's a lack of studies here. These are small studies with zero or counterintuitive results where the exposed women had a lower lung cancer risk uh, 
That seems a bit peculiar. Who knows if that could happen or not? But if you if you see like a hole here, this may suggest that there was publication bias going on, that these studies were conducted, but they they couldn't be found because they were, weren't published. They sort of disappeared in file drawers. So that's sort of another way of how we sometimes look at these funnel plots to see if there's there's like a gap here somewhere. Well, we can sort of try to, to impute missing studies using the trim and fill method. So this is a method that assumes a certain type of suppression of studies has occurred. And we can sort of impute based on this model, impute these missing studies. It makes the funnel plot look a bit more symmetric as you may expect it to look. This pulls the estimate towards zero. It's still significant in case you're wondering, it still shows an elevated risk. But that's the trim and fill method, briefly. Again, I know it has been critiqued quite a bit, but I just wanted to illustrate that you can do this here. Uh, let's move on to a meta-analysis on correlation coefficients. So the correlation between employment interview assessments. So how well, how well do people perform when they are doing a job interview? and their actual job performance. You would hope that this correlation between how well people sort of do in job interviews and actual job performance is sufficiently high. Why else would we do job interviews if, if these things are sort of completely unrelated to each other? And this has been researched a lot. And McDaniel did a meta-analysis on um, 160 studies that have examined this, this relationship. Now here, we are meta-analyzing not directly the correlation coefficients, but R to Z, Fisher R to Z transformed correlations. That's often done in meta-analysis that we, that we transform these correlations. So we need to back transform if we want to know what is the pooled correlation. This is not a correlation. This is a pooled R to Z transformed correlation. Now the back transformation here a Z to R doesn't really change the results at all or barely. Um, but anyway, so this is now our pooled correlation. On average, interview performance, job performance correlate on average 0.23. Not that impressive, I would say, but okay. Now, what I want to illustrate here is that if you have a lot of studies, like 160 studies, you may be interested in in the influence of studies on, on the results. And so when you have a lot of studies, you may not really want to look at every study individually, but you can use some diagnostic uh, diagnostics, like you can look at um, studentized residuals or standardized residuals to see if there are some potential outliers. You can look at Cook's distances to see if there are some influential studies covariance ratios, those tell you something, how data points impact the precision of the model. So actually these two studies, by adding them to the data set, decrease the precision of the model by 10 to 15%. So actually having these studies in the data set lowers the precision. Um, so these sort of influence diagnostics are you can obtain them with the influence function. And instead of looking at all the numbers, we can plot the results and, and see if anything sort of sticks out. Uh, let me go back to the BCG data set here. Can I jump in with a question then? Yes. Uh, after the back transformation of R, do we keep the same p-value given from the set score? Yes, so we, when we meta-analyze these R to Z transformed correlations, we are testing if this pooled R to Z transform, trans, transformed value is significantly different from zero. If it is, it must be the case just logically that also the back transformed value is significantly different from zero. So we don't, the p-value sort of, stays the same. You don't have to back transform the p-value. So the back transformation is purely just for having like an easier interpretation of the results. We, we don't want to think about R to Z transformed correlations. There are statistical reasons for doing this, but then 
for, for describing the results, we back transform, but we don't have to worry about the p-value. We test on the transform scale. Cool. And then one last one. Can we influence uh, can we use influence for uh, MA with a small data yeah, set? Of, yeah, of course you can. Um, it, when you only have five to 10 studies, you, you can just look at those five to 10 studies in quite a bit of detail. Um, but yes, of course you can draw these, these figures also if you only have five to 10 studies. When you have so many studies, it becomes a bit more tedious to sort of look at every study individually. Um, so that's when these, these figures become a little bit more important or useful, I would say. But yes, you can do this how, regardless of how many studies you have. Thanks. All right, back to the BCG data set. So this is what I'm doing here again, fitting my random effects model and then a Bojat plot. I never know exactly how to pronounce this. Um, so I think the the person behind this is Canadian, so this is probably like a bit French, supposed to be pronounced in a sort of French way, Boja. Um, so this is sort of another visualization to look at sort of the, the, the influence of studies. So we have on the x-axis the so-called squared Pearson residuals, which essentially tells you something about whether a particular study is an outlier. And on the y-axis, we have something that indicates the influence of a study on the results. And so um, outliers and influential studies are not exactly the same thing. Something can be an outlier and not be influential, or something can be influential and not be an outlier, or both, or neither. So what you have here on the top right-hand side are outliers that are also influential. And that's the idea with this Bojard plot to to detect these here, to kind of visualize this. All right, then cumulative meta-analysis. So in a cumulative meta-analysis, well, let me just show you the forest plot here. What we are doing here is we are just looking at the evolution of evidence over time. So we have our results from the random effects model, but what we can also do is we can say, what happens if we sort of add one study over time by order of publication year. So we have here the first study, Aronson, and then we have a meta-analysis that combines Aronson with Ferguson and Symes. So this is the result of a meta-analysis of two studies. And then we add Stein and Aronson. So we now have three studies in our meta-analysis and so on. So you can sort of look at the evolution of evidence over time. And that's a cumulative meta-analysis. All right, back to um, the lung cancer risk data set. We have so-called radial plots. What are radial plots? These were suggested by Rex Galbraith. They are also sometimes called Galbraith plots. Um, he wasn't really thinking about meta-analysis. He was just suggesting a visualization of estimates with different precisions, which is what we have in meta-analysis. So people in meta-analysis have adopted this idea um, also for meta-analysis. But what is the idea with a radial or Galbraith plot? Well, on the x-axis, we put the precision of the estimate, so one over the standard error, or here we also add tau square. So we have the precise estimates, the not so precise estimates. And on the y-axis, we put sort of a z-score. So how is, is something significant in an individual study, right? So we actually have hardly any significant studies here except this one. Um, but in any case, this is so-called a, a, a radial plot. And, and uh, there are some sort of ideas here how this can be used for diagnostic purposes. And we have sort of an arch here, or this, this, that's where the name comes from, um, or arc, arch? No, I don't know how to pronounce this. Anyway, so it's, it's a nice little plot. Um, I always joke like nobody ever uses these. Um, took me forever to write this function to draw these, these curved lines and so on. But anyway, uh, let me move on. Um, another meta-analysis on the effectiveness of acupuncture for preventing nausea after, after some kind of operation. Um, 
I'm not going to go into this, but I just want to illustrate the Labé plot. What is the idea with the Labé plot? We have two groups, treated, untreated, and we have the proportion or the log risk of the um, in the in the treated group and in the control group. And so we can sort of make a bivariate plot here to illustrate when, when is the risk the same in the two groups? That's what this diagonal reference line here is. And then we can see the points of the individual studies. And we see that in many studies, the risk of having nausea is lower compared to the control group. And so this is sometimes called a Labé plot or scatter plot of the risks in, in the two groups. All right, then let me move on to another data set. So I'm going a bit fast here because I'm always way too ambitious what I want to cover and then I need to rush through things. But uh, all right, so um, the point of this data set is not crucial. This is a hypothetical data set of 20 studies. Um, we can pull the results here. I'm using a fixed effects model. Um, that's again also not what I want to get into here. What I want to do based on this data set is to illustrate the idea of a gosh plot. So uh, let me let this run. Oh, that looks a bit ugly. Wait. Yeah. Uh, this takes a little bit of time. So what is the idea with a gosh plot? So we have we have 20 studies. And we could meta-analyze these 20 studies. Um, we, but we could also take a subset of five studies from these 20. Take five of the 20 studies, meta-analyze those. Well, there are many subsets of size five that you could take from 20 studies. We could also take all subsets of size six, seven, one, two, three. So the idea with a gosh plot is create all subsets of these different sizes, run your meta-analysis in all of these subsets, and then visualize these results. Now here, I'm not doing all possible subsets. I'm doing 20,000 random subsets. That's enough to just illustrate the idea. And then what you see here in a gosh plot, each point is a meta-analysis based on a subset of these 20 studies. And, uh, what I'm coloring in here is the studies or the not studies, the, the these meta-analytic results here are colored differently depending on whether study six is included versus excluded. And you end up here with these sort of two clusters um, that are basically distinguished by whether study six is being included or not in, in a particular subset. And what this is essentially telling you is that study six is really causing a big difference in, in the results. That is the so-called gosh plot. You can, you can also do this on all possible subsets, but it takes quite some time to run. So I didn't do this here in the slides. You can see that if you do it on all subsets, then you really get these nice sort of smooth histograms here of the effects uh, with or without this potential outlier. That is essentially the idea in a gosh plot. All right, then um, a little bit more and then we'll take a break. And jump in with another question. Sure. Um, does the QML function works with the RAM.MV? And then there's a follow-up with the... Yeah. I so think it's they, easy for you to read the chat for this one. So QML does not currently work with ARMA.MV objects. I don't think so. So that's something that I would still would have to implement. So, and, and then, so the, I can't pronounce this French, la, yeah. la B plot yeah. cannot use uh, solar. I think you should read this in the chat because I'm not sure how to ask this question, to be honest. Uh, so yeah, I can see here, the Labé plot cannot be used in R2. Yes, it can be used if you have R2. So the Labé plot, oh, well, no, sorry. The Labé plot doesn't make any sense with correlation. So um, never mind. So Labé plots are really when you have two groups, right? So you have like group one on the x-axis, group two on the y-axis. If you just have correlation coefficients, what do you put on the x versus the y-axis, right? That doesn't work. So it's it's really only for two group um, outcome or effect size measures. Yeah. 
Thanks. Okay. Um, then a little bit of a demonstration here of meta regression, right? So we have back to the BCG data set. So um, we can also fit models where we use predictors for the size of the effect. And we can include, well, quantitative predictors, absolute latitude. So half, how far from the equator were these studies conducted? Um, that's what applet here uh, represents. Um, there's a reason for why we may want to look at this. And the type of allocation were subjects randomly assigned to receive the vaccine or not, or alternating or systematic allocation. So this is sort of a categorical predictor. And we can fit meta regression models, including multiple predictors. I'm not sure if I would fit such a model with only 13 studies, but just for, for illustration purposes. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this code here. What I want to illustrate based on this is sort of a more complex forest plot. Uh, where's my forest plot? There. Um, where you have subgroups. So, right, we can also subgroup the studies based on the type of allocation. And then we can sort of make much more complex layouts where we have the results from each subgroup and the overall result. You can do this kind of stuff. Although this, this as you can see here, takes quite a bit of work. So it's not something that is completely automated. You can use the forest function. We can add text to this forest function with a text command. We can add additional polygons. So these are polygons here with the add poly function. So um, this is possible, but it's something that you need to put together yourself. I will come back maybe to this at the end, why it's done this way. Why didn't I just automate this completely, right? So, um, but yeah, you can create these complex layouts. Um, maybe just a little note here. This is base R graphs. I started to use R before there was ggplot2. Even ggplot, the, the predecessor, wasn't even around. And so I got quite comfortable with base R graphs. Uh, or graphics, and so that's what Metaphor uses. Um, if you are a ggplot user, of course, then you, you may want to do this in a different way. And there are packages for creating forest plots with uh, ggplot too. Is it possible to create a forest plot, plot using the RMA function, although we used rma.mv for the actual analysis? Uh, you could do that. Uh, the forest function also works with rma.mv object. So that works. Um, so you don't, but yeah, forest plots are just visualizations. Well, you, you want to maybe put the right results into your forest plot. So, um, right, so that should be based on the correct model or the model that you actually used for your analysis. But if you have an rma.mv analysis or object, you can also use the forest function on that. Thanks. All right. And then um, another sort of visualization that is quite often used when you're doing meta regression is these bubble plots. So here I'm putting the latitude uh, quantitative uh, moderator on the x-axis, the effect size on the y-axis. These bubbles or these points sort of reflect the different precision of the studies. We have more precise studies, less precise studies, and we can draw these, these regression or bubble plots. Um, then uh, let me run this. Uh, this takes a few moments. Um, so selection models. Let me come back to this idea of publication bias. So just imagine for the moment, we live in a crazy, crazy world where it is sort of maybe a little bit more difficult to get your study published if you have like really non-significant results. I know this is a bit crazy, right? Why, why would we select uh, studies based on their significance? But just for the moment, imagine this. So um, if this is really going on, so some kind of selection process has happened, then, then we may only find or we have sort of a tendency then to find only the more significant studies in our meta-analysis, right? So the selection is not being done by the person doing the meta-analysis. They're just finding the studies that are out there, but these studies may have undergone some kind of selection process. 
And these selection models try to actually, based on the studies that we have and that may have un undergone some kind of selection process to estimate what that selection process may have looked like. So the selection function, and it can then, these models can try to correct to some extent for this selection process. And so these are these selection models and I'm illustrating here a whole bunch of them based on the Hackshaw data set. And what they, what they all find is that that actually it seems to be the case that more significant studies have a much higher probability or likelihood of selection than less significant studies. So now the degree of selection differs here depending on which kind of selection model we use. So there are all kinds of different um, models out there, but they all sort of suggest this, this relationship with the significance of the studies. And that allows you to maybe cautiously sort of correct for publication bias. All right. The last thing that I want to illustrate here is the reporter function. So let's say you do a meta-analysis, BCG data set, random effects model, and then you get these results, right? And you're sort of starting out with meta-analysis and there are a bunch of numbers here, tau square, I squared, Q test. We have the model results. How do you make sense of this? How do you report this? How do you write it up? Well, this is where the reporter function comes into play. So we, I'm just gonna use the reporter function on this model object. And what this does is it writes an on the fly dynamically an analysis report for you. So it, it tells you the analysis was carried out using the log risk ratio as the outcome measure. A random effects model was fitted. How was the amount of heterogeneity estimated using Remmel estimation? The tau square, Q statistic, I square, you get references for everything. How can we check for outliers, influential studies based on studentized residuals and cook distances? How can we check for, well, not publication bias, but for asymmetry in the funnel plot through these sort of tests, the regression test, the rank correlation test. Then you get the results, 13 studies were included. The range of the observed effects, you get the pooled um, estimate, the confidence interval, whether it's significant or not. Then you get a forest plot, the results from the Q test, the prediction interval. It, notices that even though the average effect is negative, the prediction interval also spans into a positive range. So it points out that although the average outcome is estimated to be negative, in some studies, the true outcome may in fact be positive. So it, it sees this and then writes this text. Um, it doesn't detect any sort of outliers or influential studies based on some rules. There are some rules built into the reporter function to make a decision whether there are outliers present or not. These rules are not perfect. Otherwise, I cannot write a report unless I have a rule. And then we get a, a funnel plot and then the results from the rank and the regression test. And then you get some references for everything. So this is dynamically on the fly created. You can also get a PDF if uh, that's what you prefer, right? So you get this as a, as a PDF. You can, you can also get a Word document or a docx uh, file or open this up in LibreOffice, uh, right? Now, this doesn't look so nice. The resolution is a bit low, but the point here is just that this gives you like a template of how you can sort of write up your results. It's, it's for teaching purposes, quite useful. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that this is, this is not pre-written, right? So if I change, for example, study six to be like a outlier, now let me recreate the report. The report of course changes. Right now we see here this, this, this clear outlier. Now you don't need diagnostics to figure that out, but anyway, so now it detects this, right? So um, one study, Stain and Aronson, 
um, seems to be a potential outlier and also influential based on its Cook's distance, right? So I think this is really kind of cool, I have to say. Um, it's not finished. Um, it doesn't do meta regression models for the moment. So it doesn't do more complex models because um, it's, it's really tricky to write a, a function that generates text that, that actually is a bit readable dynamically. So um, yes, it does report the R markdown document. So that is saved, right? So um, you, can, you can find it under the temp directory here, and then you can use this, this markdown document um, and, and use it further. Okay, all right. So I'm, I'm way over the time. Should we um, take a little break now? Yeah, let's do a short break and uh, then we'll continue. Uh, do you want to do a bit of a Q&A during the break or do you want an actual break? Let's, let's just do an actual break and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. Okay, uh, then let's be back uh, in nine minutes then, five past half. Sounds good. I'll put up a timer. Are we continue? All right. So a um, few words about validation and testing. So whenever somebody writes an R package, um, you have to sort of trust them that they are um, implementing things correctly. While I do spend quite a bit of time making sure that things are working correctly, of course, I, I also make mistakes, uh, but um, what are some of the things that I do? Well, I do uh, comparisons with other R packages or software packages. So either we are all doing it wrong or we're all doing it correctly. Um, if we get the same results. Um, I also compare the results of published analyses, not having used metaphor, of course, otherwise it becomes circular with what I can get from metaphor. And on the metaphor website, you can also find lots of analysis examples to illustrate this. I do simulation studies. So um, just for my own sake, to make sure that things are working like they should be, you can reason uh, based on theory that you would expect something to work or behave in a certain way. And then you can check this through simulations. There's also now pretty decent user base of metaphor. So people may find bugs um, and report them. I also use automated testing. Um, so using the test that uh, package in combination with metaphor, the code coverage is not quite as high as I would like it to be. It's about 70% right now. I really want to get this up, but writing tests is super tedious and not one of my favorite things to do. And you, are, you, get, you get your money back if you find a bug. All right. Um, so now let me highlight some interesting applications. Um, going to pick out one or two of them because I don't think we'll have the time to go through all of them. But the first one here is phylogenetic meta-analysis. So what is, what is that? So one of the big areas where people are doing meta-analysis these days, besides uh, medicine and, and psychology or the social sciences more broadly, is biology or more specifically ecology. And um, so in, in this area, people are doing studies with all kinds of different species, right? We, we psychologists uh, or, or people in medicine tend to do research on, on humans, uh, but ecologists are looking at all kinds of different species. And uh, these species have sort of a shared evolutionary history. And so they tend to be sometimes more similar or less similar to each other based on how long ago they have split from a common ancestor. So now if you're looking at certain treatment, let's say you're looking at different plants and you're looking at a fertilizer for these plants, how, how much that actually makes these plants grow, then if you have all these different plant species being studied, you may find that um, a certain plants react more to the fertilizer than, than others. And that tends to be more, the, the reaction to the treatment tends to be more similar in species that are evolutionary more similar to each other. 
And we want to take this into consideration in a phylogenetic meta-analysis. So we have studies having examined some kind of treatment and we have different species who, for which we can create this phylogeny. That phylogeny can be translated based on a certain model of evolution into a correlation matrix. And so you see strong correlations for species that, that have split recently as opposed to um, species that have split a long time ago may essentially be uncorrelated. And so we want to take this into consideration. So I didn't know anything about this until 2012, when I was invited to be part of a working group to actually develop methods and software for doing these so-called phylogenetic meta-analyses. And this is when I actually sort of developed the rma.mv function. I had sort of versions of it prior to this, but I didn't put them into metaphor because they weren't quite ready. And so then I finally had some space and time to really write this function. And at, the, at that time, I directly incorporated the possibility to add known correlation matrices to these more complex um, models. And I want to illustrate this based on a meta-analysis that we did back then on inoculating plants with mycorrhizal fungi. All right, so what is this about? So we have these fungi, these well, mushrooms um, in the soil, and they um, attach to the roots of trees and plants. And often this is a symbiotic relationship. So the trees and plants are better able through these fungi that attach to the roots to absorb uh, water and minerals. And in return, the fungi sort of get something in return, like um, sugars, carbohydrates, vitamins, right? So it's sort of a win-win situation. Now, through this, this, uh, through these fungi, the the plants, the trees tend to grow better, taller, um, and this has been studied quite a bit, um, actually a lot. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of studies on this, and. Um, so what you have is studies where you take plants, you put fungi into the soil in the treatment group and not in the control group. Then you let these plants grow and you measure plant growth. So you weigh the plants, how heavy they are after a certain amount of time, right? So you can measure plant mass and compare them, the treated group versus the control group. So um, these colleagues, they assembled this massive data set. Um, here I'm fo focusing on a subset of 359 papers containing almost 3,000 effects. Now, these are more complex sort of uh, data sets. So you may have uh, one control condition, but multiple treatments and these multiple treatment conditions are being compared against the same control condition. So you have these sort of control sets. And we uh, had almost 300 different plant species that were being studied here. And again, these plant species, they are correlated with each other through this correlation matrix, which we can construct from a phylogeny. So the, the model here, which is a more complex model, and so this required the use of this rma.mv function. It takes as input effect sizes and the variances of them, but now we need sort of more random effects to account for, for some of the dependencies. So we have papers and we have these control sets within papers, right? So we have... Um, multiple effects that are sharing the same control group possibly in some papers. Then we have the individual effects within these control sets. We have plant species, and we can also allow this, this random effect to be correlated according to this phylogenetic correlation matrix. So I'm not going to go into all of the details of what exactly is happening here, but this is just showing some of the more advanced analysis capabilities in metaphor 
through this um, a.mv function. So then you get estimates of the between paper variants, of the between control set variants, of the variance in the individual effect sizes, the between plant species variants, and also how much of that variance is due to phylogeny. So how much of that can be attributed to effects being correlated due to the shared evolutionary history of these almost 300 different plant species that are being studied. And so we find on average that yes, inoculated plants do grow better, taller, uh, or have heavier plant weight um, significantly so, and then you can look at moderators of this. So um, if you were to use a simpler model, let's say you were to treat these almost 3000 effect size estimates as if they are just sort of 3000 independent studies, you would completely underestimate the standard error. So you are sort of here in a standard random effects model would be completely ignoring all of these dependencies. And so that is going to give you quite misleading results. You can add let's say a random effect at the paper level or some of these additional effects. And you can see how the confidence interval gets wider and the full model has a rather wide confidence interval, but it excludes zero. So we still find a significant effect. Um, but I just want to sort of show that it can really matter whether you ignore dependencies whether versus accounting for them. Um, I think I'm going to skip this one. Um, this is on spatial correlation structures. So accounting for the fact that different estimates are spatially correlated with each other. This was on a, very briefly based on a meta-analysis of effects um, that were measured in rivers at different sampling stations along French rivers. And so these sampling stations are sometimes further apart, sometimes close together. And so these effects that you get um, are spatially correlated with each other. And so um, that needed to, needed to be accounted for in this analysis um, by constructing a distance matrix to indicate how far um, apart are these different stations and then using a correlation, a spatial correlation structure in the model. So, um, but I'm sort of gonna skip through this very quickly here, but just because of, uh, in the interest of time. So, um, but we can specify these distance matrices and specify correlation structures and, and account for the correlation in the effects that arise through their spatial configuration. You can also specify latitude, longitude, um, if you have coordinates, um, that is also possible. And then you do find correlation, spatial correlation here, depending on the distance between these uh, stations, these sampling stations. And um, well, once you go maybe beyond 30 kilometers, then the, the correlation disappears, but closer together, you get quite strong correlation. Let me, let me use a different uh, example here to also illustrate some of the more complex modeling that can be done. So this is back to humans on the so-called generation effect. What is the generation effect? That is the phenomenon that we tend to better remember information if we generated it as opposed to simply reading information. Now, maybe it's just a matter of another a couple of years before somebody will discover that also this effect is, is just purely due to p-hacking and doesn't really exist. But okay, let's not get into this. I think at the moment, um, this seems to be a fairly robust effect and it has been shown to be present across many studies. Um, so um, what you do in these studies is basically you, you ask participants to to recall words that were either just simply read or where there was some kind of process of generating these words, maybe based on word fragments. And then you look at the recall rate in, in these different groups or under these different conditions. And you tend to see higher recall when the words were actually self-generated. But these are complex studies often. They, they the same paper, may report multiple experiments. 
the experiment may use a mix of within and between uh, subject factors. So the data structure was, was rather intricate. So just to illustrate here, article one reports a single experiment, but some articles reported multiple experiments. And it only had two conditions, the read and generate condition, and it was a between subjects design, two different samples within, within this study. Study two is a within subjects design, right? The same subjects were in the read and the generate condition. Hopefully there was some counterbalancing of the order, right? To sort of smooth out order effects, but this is a within subjects design. Or we have a more complex within subjects design where there was a single read condition and then two different generate conditions. So maybe where how the, the type of generation of the words, how this was done was manipulated. Or study four actually is a, also within subjects design, but a two by two factorial design. So we have regenerate and then we have some other factor, uh, maybe maybe the amount of time between reading or generating the words and recalling the words was maybe manipulated also in, in this other factor. And so what we also have here is a variable to indicate what should be compared with each other. What is a pairing, right? So here it's quite simple um, in the first three studies, but in study four, we wouldn't want to compare this recall rate with this generate rate because they are not alike except for um, reading versus generating. Something else was manipulated here. So these two should be compared against each other and these two, right? These are forming these pairings. So this is sort of similar to what I described earlier with the meta-analysis on these phylogenetics. You sometimes have more complex or often you have more complex experiments and you need to make sure that you're sort of comparing alike with alike, except for the factor or the variable that you're interested in. So this data set included 126 articles that reported on 310 experiments with 582 samples and included over 1,600 recall estimates, which in turn were sort of grouped in these 804 pairings. So where you are sort of comparing alike with alike, except for was it a read or generate condition, right? So we have this condition variable here to distinguish that. That is what we are interested in. But to account for this sort of complex structure, we have random effects for article, experiment with an article, sample with an experiment, the individual effect within a sample, and then a separate random effect across random effect for these pairings. These, pa this, these pairings are not nested. The rest sort of forms a hierarchy, but um, these, these uh, where's a good example here in study one or article one, this pairing is not nested within sample. These should be compared against each other. Right, so this forms a pairing, but this is not nested within sample. So this is getting added here as a crossed random effect. So again, these models are getting progressively more complex and you really need to spend some thinking, some time thinking about, okay, what is sort of an appropriate data structure and a way of reflecting the possible dependencies here. And then there's something about sparse equal to true. I'll come back to this in a moment. Is the data set that you are referencing now available in the metaphor package? Uh, this one is not, um, but I may actually ask these uh, co-authors whether we can um, include it. I believe the data set is actually, uh, was published together with a, with a paper. I would have to double check this, but in any case, I do want to put this data set into the package itself because it's a nice illustrative data set, yes. Nice, thanks. Um, so again, you get these variance components for, for between article, between experiment, between sample and so on variances. And then you have these recall rates for the intercept reflects read conditions. So on average, about 48% of the words recalled correctly. 
And under a generate condition, it's about 10 percentage points higher. So about 50 versus 60% of the words uh, recalled on average correctly when they are generated. Okay, so the last thing that I want to mention here is something about sparse matrix structure. So you saw here sparse equal to true. What is this about? So when I originally wrote the, this function or well, the RMA function or everything in metaphor, I, I didn't really think too much about large data sets. So the way I wrote these functions was to directly work internally with matrices that are of K by K dimension, where K is the number of rows in the data set. Now the data sets I had seen at the time, like, like the um, Hackshaw data set had like 37 studies, well, that's already large, or McDaniel with 160, that's huge for meta-analysis. Well, I didn't imagine that anybody would be running meta-analyses on much larger, larger data sets. So by the way this, this was written, the, when these matrices get really large and you do matrix algebra on them, things start to get really, really slow. So I was contacted then in 2013 by some researchers from Vanderbilt who were running models with like 8,000 data points. Now for meta-analysis, this is like humongous. I mean, if you're doing anything with big data, this is like peanuts, but for meta-analysis, this is like unheard of. And their models took like days to converge and they were wondering what is going on. And, and I had to sort of embarrassingly admit that I just didn't write these functions efficiently to deal with such large data sets. So then what I implemented is this option to represent matrices internally as sparse matrices. So when you have a matrix like this, this could be like a variance covariance matrix where you have two studies and two effects in each study. And you need to take the inverse of that matrix. Well, instead of taking this inverse of this four by four matrix, you can also just take this, this inverse of these two sub matrices, right? This is, this is the same. And so this is actually a sparse matrix. Now here, this is just a toy example, but imagine it's much bigger these zeros don't need to be stored. And if you take the inverse, you can do this much more computationally efficiently if you represent a matrix as a sparse matrix. And so this is what the sparse equal to true option does is it represents these matrices internally as sparse matrices, which can speed things up depending on the model. It depends on the model. If you have correlations all over the place, then these matrices are not sparse, but in these multi-level models, you tend to get this. And then this can really speed things up. But this only makes sense for larger data sets. Don't try this if you only have like a hundred studies, even if it has a multi-level structure, it may end up actually slowing things down. So this becomes interesting if you have a thousand data points or more, and you actually have sort of a structure that would lend itself to sparseness. Okay, final uh, slide on a little bit philo philosophy behind metaphor. So when whenever I'm writing on metaphor, I'm really trying to build a toolbox and not individual tools. What do I mean by that? So uh, people suggest all kinds of cool models out there, like fancy models for particular cases, uh, for running particular analyses. But if you implement a particular model, um, well, then you have a function just for that, right? And then you have another function for yet another model. And that just becomes really sort of um, hard to maintain, also to have some kind of consistency across all of these different functions for these different models. So I try to think about what is, what is sort of a logical principle that is inherent throughout all of these models. And the rma.mv function is a good example for this. This function allows you to do what people have described as multi-level meta-analysis. It allows you to do what people have described as multivariate meta-analysis or network meta-analysis or these phylogenetic meta-analyses or these spatial temporal models, those response models. These all can be fitted 
based on this one function. Of course, you need to understand how to make use of that function for a particular purpose, but then it's one function I need to worry about as opposed to five, six, 10 different functions. And all of these models can be combined with cluster robust variance estimation, which you will hear if you are here next week more about from James Pustoyevsky. Um, he will talk about the club sandwich package in detail to show how that can be combined with some of these types of models. And the last thing um, is listen to users. So it's quite a bit of what I have described here at the end, especially are developments that came about because people contacted me and said, what's going on? Why is it running so slow? Or how do I deal with spatial correlation? And if I can see how some of these things fit within this general framework underneath metaphor, then I'm very happy to, to add this functionality to metaphor. So I try to really listen and see what people want to do. And, and that drives quite a bit of the development of the metaphor package. That's it. Okay, some references that are way too small for you to read. Uh, but again, I will put these slides on my website and then you can take a look if you are curious. And now I'm happy to uh, take any sort of additional questions.